Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. We're really glad to have you for today's show. My name's C.R. Wiley, and I'm a pastor. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some things with regard to being a pastor in a minute, but I'll save that. But uh, for now, just so you know, as I said, I'm a pastor, I've taught philosophy, I've been a real estate investor, I've actually also been a home improvement contractor, I've done a range of things. Uh, Enough about me. Tom, talk a little about about yourself and and tell us a little bit about guitar. Okay, uh, Tom Price, uh, systematic theologian, Christian ethicist, teaching both at a variety of places, but uh, I also, yeah, I did my undergrad in classical and jazz guitar. Um, I love to play the guitar. I taught guitar for 18 years. Wow. And so, and I'm getting back into playing guitar. So now that I'm coming upon a little bit of a tiny break for the holidays, I have already started, uh, restrung some things, and I'm um, about to do a little uh, damage, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, saw some, we saw some photographs online with you and your guitar and Sea Hag. Yes. Sea Hag, <laughs> which happens to be the IPA of choice uh, with uh, Tom Price. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm professor of early modern European history at Central Connecticut State University, senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and I've also written a couple of things. Now, you also play some instruments, not just one instrument. You've got a range of instruments. Tell us, tell us, tell us about the the uh, the the unknown Glenn Sunshine, the Glenn Sunshine I, that other people have not actually had a chance to experience. Yeah, I, I'm mostly a woodwinds player. Okay. Uh, I used to play a little bit of, of guitar and actually tuba. Um, oh, tuba? Uh, yeah, in the marching band. I learned, I learned flute and tuba in the same summer. Um, but I'm mostly woodwinds, clarinet, um, sax, once I get it overhauled, uh, different kinds of flutes, regular fru- flute, Irish flute, you know, very simple system flutes. Penny whistles, recorders, uh, and I've got a, here's going to be a shock for all of you, I've got a 16th century German bagpipe. We, <laughs> I a, a genuinely, bagpipe? Yes, I genuinely <laughs> like the really obnoxious early woodwinds. Now, now with, with the German bagpipe, what makes that uh, German, and, and what distinguishes it from what we normally think of uh, uh, when we think about bagpipes in Scotland? Well, the, two things are important about it. First of all, it's designed for indoor playing, which means it will not blast your eardrums out. Okay. Hmm. Um, but, which, which Lynn is grateful for. Yes. <laughs> that's the only reason I was able to get it. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing about it is it's, it, it plays a different scale. Okay. I mean, and, and it doesn't... The drone system, there, there are various ways you can set up the drones on it, but again, it's different from what you hear on the Highland Pipe, which is what most people are most familiar with. Yeah, no, no. Tell me a little more about the Germans and the bagpipe, because I mean, okay. I, I've never associated Germany and bagpipes. There are actually <laughs> multiple kinds of German bagpipes. Huh. You have, translating them into English, you have a reproduction of what they think medieval pipes were like. They call them market pipes because they're so loud you can only play them in an open market type area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have um, shepherd's pipes, Schaefer pipe. Uh, there's um, uh, one that's actually used all through Central Europe, which is a little bit strange looking. The drone actually goes down your back, and they've got a curved bell on the bottom. It's usually called a duty or sometimes a bach. Uh, and then the one I have is the indoor, smaller indoor one called a humlishin. Hmm. So well, what, what got us into this, folks, in case you're wondering, why are they talking about instruments and stuff like that right now? Well, before we turned on the microphones, uh, Tom told us that he was getting back into, getting back into guitar, and I asked you, Tom, is it like riding a bike, or is it kind of like? Because you were you you said how long had it been since you really I put it down for ten years. Ten years. I know, I know for those who have seen me, it doesn't look like I'm that old, but <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you said it, it kind of is like riding a bike in a way. Yes, it's uh, one of the things that uh, I mean. I didn't. You don't when you've worked hard on the instrument, you don't forget kind of the theory and the forms. And ah, the our waiter Ethan's here with some beers for folks. All right. Okay, so Ethan, now you're on the podcast. Yeah, you're on the podcast now. <laughs> I'm all set for now. Thanks. Another, have another one. You're coming around. All right. So, so it's you. You, you kind of pick it up and yeah, you pick it. As I, I picked it back up, um, really, I spent a couple of days, long days, with it, um, and just did a lot of hand exercises and. Uh, uh, finger strengthening exercises which you learn when you're starting anyway right, the instrument right. and yeah within a few days uh the the coordination and the um hand strength comes back i had to kind of re 
uh, I had to kind of get the calluses back again, though. Right, they right. Kinda, they kind of worn off, you know, worn down, and right. um, and so yeah, there's a little bit of pain involved, as all good things require these days. And, <laughs> Or should. Anyway. <laughs> right, right. Well, the thing that you know, I sat down for years and, and picked up about four years ago, five years ago, was um, my, my art, drawing, you know, visual art stuff. And, uh, and the reason why I'm bringing that up now is, is, is because, you know, I, that's, what I, that's what I felt like when I, because I, I had been away for, uh, like, going on 30 years. Wow. And uh, I'd had a dream of uh, being a comic book artist. Uh, I could tell you all the guys that I followed and the things that I was into. But um, I've gotten back into it at a uh, actually at the level of uh, illustrating some stuff that I'm working on, and I've got a an interview tomorrow mm. with an agent uh, concerning uh, a book, children's book called Daisy. Mm. And I think maybe I've shared that uh, a little bit, maybe not on the podcast, but in different settings that maybe people have have had a chance to maybe. Uh, well, I I think what I'll do is I'll probably put some some of the drawings up for that. Yeah, that, that'd be uh, that'd be great. Uh, maybe on our Facebook page. But anyway, that's a little bit more about me. And I do have an announcement to make. And, I, and before we get into the subject of the day, and we are going to get to the subject of the day, folks, <laughs> so don't, don't worry. We don't do this to you very often, but we're doing it today. Um, I'm in a, a transition. Now, the, the guys know about the transition, but you don't know. I'm going to be leaving uh, Connecticut, and I'm going to be uh, working at a church, pastoring in uh, Washington State. That's uh, like 3,000 miles away. You know, that's not an <laughs> insignificant transition. And uh, it's going to be uh, in the Portland, Oregon uh, region. So I'm actually going to essentially a suburb of Portland, Oregon. Hmm. So that kind of helps you locate where in Washington State I'll be. I'm not going to be up near Seattle. I'm not going to be near Spokane. I'm going to be down uh, right outside of Portland. It's actually, you actually, you get out of the airport in Portland, and you just drive across the, the Columbia. You can see the see Mount Hood in the distance there. And then you're in Vancouver, Vancouver, Washington, and uh, that's where I'm going to be. But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll let folks know more about that as days, uh, per, you know, you know as, as we get closer, as the days go by and we get closer to the, that transition. But we're trying and, to find a convenient pub for all of us to meet in, <laughs> but that may be a bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah, fear virtual, not, virtual pub is in the, in the right. works. <laughs> yeah, fear not, folks. The show will go on, as you can tell. We've just made comments that, uh, that uh, Tom and Glenn have uh, made. But anyway, uh, let's get to the subject of the day, and it's really apropos because it's uh, Advent, we're in the Christmas season, and uh, it's Glenn's day. So what are we talking about today, Glenn? Uh, I thought we would look at an early Christian writer, uh, early 4th century, by the name of Athanasius. All right. And Athanasius wrote a, a treatise called On the Incarnation. And I thought it would be worth taking a look at this for a couple of different reasons. Uh, but what I want to start with is that there are several editions of this that have come out. And by the way, it's available online in PDF uh, with an introduction by C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And Lewis's introduction, it includes, I was actually rather surprised when I finally read it because it included a whole bunch of things I've, I'd heard quoted from Lewis and didn't realize it was actually from, that. from his introduction here. Huh. So what Lewis says about this, and this is, I think, really a good place to start, Christians tend not to read anything that isn't written by <laughs> contemporary people, yeah. except perhaps some of our listeners who might be into the Puritans, right. you know, things like that. Right. Um, Lewis argues that we get so much of what we think of past writers, uses Plato as an example, we get it through modern writers. We don't get it from reading Plato. Mm -hmm. and he says, look, you know, any school kid, at least in his day, any school kid could read Plato, and they wouldn't get everything out of it, but they'd get something out of it. Yeah. You read modern writers on Plato, and you're not likely to get anything at all from them because they're much harder than Plato is. Yeah, right, That's right, right. And he says, when you go back to the ancient writers... You, you'll find that they're much more understandable than many of their modern interpreters. Hmm. So that's sort of the first point that he makes. Yeah. But yeah. then a second that, uh, that I think is really important is that he says that, well, somewhere in other places, I think it is he uses the word chronological snobbery. Yeah. yeah. You know, the idea that our, because we know so much, our generation, you know, we're so well-educated, we're so well-informed and all of that, 
the past doesn't really have anything to say to us. Mm -hmm. And if the past disagrees with us, the past is wrong. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the trick is, he says, you know, every, every era has its blind spots. Mm -hmm. Every era has some things that it gets right and other things it gets disastrously wrong. And the only way you can see through the blind spots of your own era is to read works written in other eras. Mm -hmm. If you just read contemporary writers, you're only going to be seeing contemporary biases, which you probably share with them, and therefore will never recognize them. Right, right. So he recommends, actually, for every modern book you read, read one old book. Yeah. He says, if you can't do that, make it three to one. Okay. Three modern to one, one old book. So... This is, a, I think, a really good point that he makes that, you know, because we do have blind spots. Our era has right. got certain ways of looking at things that aren't necessarily the way things really are. Mm -hmm. you know, he says the past writers aren't any better than we are. They had blind spots too, but we'll see those. Right, yeah. We, they, they will help us see our own, though. The other advantage, he says, of reading old books is that people talk about the divisions that exist within Christianity. But he says if you read the old books what you will find is that however much they may disagree, there is a such thing as what Richard Baxter called mere Christianity, mm -hmm. which is where Lewis got his title. There is a common core of faith that runs throughout all history mm -hmm. and throughout the church. And, you know, with all of the emphasis that we frequently get on divisions and things like that, it's really helpful to remind ourselves and to see the great core of faith that has run through all the different generations. Right, right. So those are a couple of points from the introduction that I think are worth noting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tom, did, did you, you had mentioned one particular quote in there that I didn't know if you wanted to bring up. Um, well, it's the one with Niebuhr, and he's talking about contemporary writers. Oh, yeah, it was very similar where he, um, he talks about, let me see if I can find it. He talks about, um, he goes, whenever you find a little study circle of Christian you know, a little Christian fellowship, you can almost be certain that there's, they're not studying St. Luke or St. Paul or St. Augustine or Aquinas or Hooker or Butler, but maybe Mariton, who was around right, right. a contemporary of the day, or Niebuhr or Miss Sayers or even himself. Right. And his point is you sh not that you shouldn't, of course, read his books, but the emphasis is like Glenn's point. It's that the, the contemporary um, distillation of, of the past um, seems more accessible to us and less foreign, and therefore we feel like we, we, we want to move in, into that directly. And I think Lewis's point is, is really great, and I think this is the way, I mean, even any Christian who wants to understand comprehensibly what Christianity is, right. they can't just look at its contemporary form or even the, really you can't just pick one pocket of the time in the church and think that represents the whole thing right. um, and we forget that the, especially the early fathers if you will of the church they were for the first time confronting bringing this gospel into the uttermost parts of the world mm -hmm. they're confronting ideas that were not familiar to everyone mm -hmm. thank you Right. Um, they're confronting these things. All set, almost set. And challenges for the first time. And so they have a stock of wisdom mm -hmm. of how they uh, uh, turn to the scriptures and how they actually engage the culture. I think that we've often lost because we don't read them. Yeah. And so we don't know how to, to we, we, we become reactionary or we absorb everything. And we don't know how to use wisdom to actually um, draw off of the wellspring of wisdom right. to, to actually address issues and ideas well, because this, we've lost touch with this. Well, and Athanasius is a really good person to think about that very thing with. I mean, when we think about Athanasius, we can think about, obviously, the incarnation, but we can also think about the famous statement that he made, Athanasius contra mundum, right. Athanasius against the world, which was actually uh, his, I guess, uh, battle cry, not with regard to sort of a secular culture, but with the Arians, right? If right. Yeah. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Athanasius, at the Council of Nicaea, where they debated the whether Jesus was actually God or the, the firstborn created angel, um, which was essentially the alternate viewpoint held by a man named Arius, 
the real champion of the orthodox position was Athanasius. Yeah. He was the one who was arguing most strenuously against Arius. And oddly enough, he wasn't even at the council. Now, now <laughs> it's right. my understanding that he was exiled several times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was seven times, something like that. I don't remember the number, but yeah, yeah he got yeah. himself into trouble pretty regularly. And he, and he was yeah. friends with, yeah, the, the monastic groups because he always had to go hide somewhere. <laughs> right. They were the ones willing to take him in. Yeah, now, now think about this. We yeah, he's also the one who writes The Life of St. Anthony. That's right, Which yeah, is going to be right. one of the things that's going to trigger the monastic movement. And yeah. also be uh, instrumental in the conversion of Augustine. Yeah. yeah. You know, so yeah. so this is a guy that's uh, significant for a range of reasons, but, but this is a guy that a lot of people would have had... A, would, at the time, been uncomfortable having visit their church to speak. He was you know, the Doug Wilson. <laughs> of his that's, right, that's right. That's what I, you know. You knew where I was going. So, <laughs> just because somebody is a pariah at the at at the moment doesn't mean he's wrong. Doesn't mean that his views are nonsense or crazy necessarily. Although that can happen. But it, it, what we ought to be thinking about is not so much what do the cool kids think at the cool table about so-and-so, or does he get invited to write for the Atlantic uh, or put you know, uh, opinion pieces in the New York Times, but is he right? Mm -hmm. Is he right? And why is he, is he, or, is he or isn't he? That's what we really should be concerned about. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, moving into what he wrote here, um, it starts in a place that's really near and dear to Tom's heart, the issue of creation. Yeah. Yeah. But what is most striking about it is his discussion on the Incarnation deals primarily with Jesus' death and resurrection. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is not what we think of no. around this time of year when we're thinking of the Incarnation. But we'll get into some of the argumentation yeah. there you know, as we go, go forward. So he, he begins with talking about creation and fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... He, you know, we're all familiar with the idea of the fall into sin. We think about it primarily in terms of personal guilt. Yeah. You know, we are guilty and therefore we need forgiveness. We think of it in terms of legal categories. This is really peculiar to Western Christianity, yeah. to the Latin world. <clears throat> Ath Athanasius sees the problem as being the fall into sin, but he views it through a really, really different lens. And I think that that's, again, one of the points that Lewis is making. I think it's really helpful to take a look at how he frames the problem. It isn't just human guilt. Mm -hmm. It's something that goes well, well beyond that. Yeah. Um, but, Tom, Tom, did you want to throw in anything on the creation part of this verse before we get there? Um, yeah. Um, I think one of the interesting things, of course, is he, he kind of... Um, Ethan. I'll do that vanilla porter now. Yeah. You know what Chris is getting. <laughs> <laughs> right. right as we talk about creation. <laughs> um, so, yeah, one of the things he points out, of course, is the centrality of the word, which is logos, to both creation and, and redemption. Now, that, just that statement that you just made, Tom, is utterly alien to many of the people I know. Yeah, and unfortunately, we talk of creation only from the side of redemption to the point we almost eclipse it. Um, so so we, we talk about being saved and, and being um, brought into union with, with Christ, but we don't, know what, we don't know that that has a form and, 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 and a final shape to it. <laughs> you know, within evangelicalism, I think that when you talk about creation, the thing that they're really anchored into is how and when did it happen? Yes. You know, was yeah. it six days? Was it six yeah. ages? Was it, you know, which, the, how long ago was which it? Which was those the sorts least of things. bit of concern and for that, the church for most of its history. And, and, yeah, and that is a product of post-enlightenment rationalism. Yeah. You yeah. know, they would never believe that or accept that, but it really is. That's, yeah. Because the significance of creation, the significance of Genesis 1, is not in giving us a history of what happened chronologically or anything yeah. else. Whatever you may think of that issue, that's not the main point. That's right. And he hits it, Athanasius, he hits about it, he moves right to the, the most significant thing about the doctrine of creation is it's the introduction of creaturely being entirely. Mm -hmm. And he talks mm -hmm. about right. sin as the pull into non-existence, um, to nihil. And then he criticizes the alternate views of, of paganism and Gnosticism and everything else for, for not getting that fundamental out of nothing 
um, not out of matter, pre-existing matter, and not in conflict with some kind of eternal matter, but actually, and not merely a divine craftsman, which is interesting, because yeah. he understood where, where a lot of people today in evangelical worlds, they kind of see God as basically the one who gives the, the design to everything, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he really, he, he hits on those things that we've been kind of t- retrieving in, in our talks, but then he connects it, as Glenn said, to the, the, lo, the, the word, the eternal word, who becomes flesh. And I think this is the flip side. I mean, this is sort of what a, D- Oliver Donovan's work of cre- uh, resurrection and, and moral order, right, or mm-hmm. created order. Mm-hmm. Because it's the very word that becomes flesh that embodies in the most concrete way that form that creation takes as it moves towards its, its perfection. Mm-hmm. And right. so I think this is where he, he connects those two. Thank you. Yeah. And the... the th- where he ends up going on this, I, like I said, as, as one who's really been brought up in the Western tradition, I was really taken with this because it's something that's really very different. Mm-hmm. Um, what he says is, um, let's see, you may be wondering why we are discussing the origin of man when we set out to talk about the words becoming man. <laughs> the former subject is relevant to the latter for, for this reason. It was our sorry case that caused the word to come down our transgression that called out his love for us so that he made haste to help us and to appear among us. It is we who were the cause of his taking human form and for our salvation that in his great love he was both born and manifested in the human body, and so on. It's going to continue on from there. But the interest, but where he goes with this is, yes, it's about our salvation, but that's actually the least issue that he discusses. Yeah. Um, so where does he go from where, there? Where he goes, he talks about what he calls the divine dilemma. Okay. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is in chapter two. He says, the thing that was happening in truth uh, was both monstrous and unfitting the, with the fall into sin and right. the result of it. It would, of course, have been unthinkable that God should go back upon his word and that man having transgressed should not die. God promised, if you sin, you will die. Right. But it was equally monstrous that beings which once had shared the nature of the word should perish and turn back again into non-existence through corruption. Mm. It was unworthy of the goodness of God that creatures made by him should be brought to nothing through the deceit wrought upon man by the devil. And it was supremely unfitting that the work of God in mankind should disappear either through their own negligence or through the deceit of evil spirits. As then the creatures whom he had created reasonable, like the word, were in fact perishing, and such noble works were on the road to ruin, what then was God being God to do? Was he to let corruption and death have their way with them? In that case, what was the use of having created them in the beginning? He goes on on from there. (laughs) And this, by the way, is an argument that I've heard articulated just recently. You know, if... If we're, you know, if we're faced with judgment and hell, why did God create us in the first place? Mm-hmm. You know, and well, the answer is, of course, in the incarnation. The th- but what he points to isn't just our need. Yeah. What he points to is something about the character of God yeah. and the yeah. dilemma that God <laughs> faces with the fall into sin. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, either his entire work of creation is nullified. Right. Hmm. Or, on the other hand, he has to pass judgment on humanity, and therefore, well, that, that's, that's really where the nullification takes place. Or he has to act unjustly and not punish sin. Right, right. Yeah, so. the, the thing about that, of course, is it takes us out of ourselves, which is something right. we're not really, <laughs> you know, uh, given to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we're, we're, what he's doing is he's giving us in a sort, of a, sort of a, let's journey into a, a perspective that it can only be understood when you're thinking about things from within this mm. project that God has undertaken, the you know creation of man, and it's it appears to have been it it, it appears that it's gone for naught, literally for naught. I mean, it's going to yeah. end up going uh, you know, amounting to nothing in the end, and uh, that's not going to be uh, that's not going to happen. Now, of course, you know some of our uh, reform folks who think about things uh, from the perspective of predestination and so forth will object at this point and, and don't don't take us to 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 uh to be saying anything that we're not saying we're, we're just kind of looking at this from a particular 
kind of at a particular layer or in a particular as a particular slice of a much larger uh, mm-hmm. such sort of thing that could be described. So we're not contradicting, you know, God's foreknowledge and all of that kind of right. thing. And I would add that although Athanasius doesn't go here, my argument is that in many ways humanity's ultimate fate is higher than it would have been had we not fallen. Oh yeah, well that's yeah. that's yeah. And, so, and so all of this is, you know, but it, he, Athanasius doesn't go there. He doesn't deal with that issue. That's not what's a concern of his because of the time in which he was writing. Yeah, right. There were attacks on whether or not you could even talk about the word incarnate. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so he was providing a, an apologetic for why that makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't. He was not dealing with our particular issues of predestination and things of that sort. Right, right. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> anything that comes to mind, uh, Tom? Um, not yet. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> waiting for the next steps. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I agree with all that. So yeah. he, he goes on to say that because... Bec- because of this situation, because of the situation that God is in, the word becomes human, takes on a human nature and all of that sort of thing, because it was the one way in which creation, well, there, there's a lot more we'll, we'll probably read as we go along, but basically only the creator could restore the creation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the word as the means through which God created the universe entered into the creation to restore it. Yeah. And because humanity was, I, I think he would argue that we lost the image of God. I think that's the implication in Athanasius. I would disagree with him there. But ultimately, the image of God is restored in us through the, ima- the ultimate image of God, who is Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, that's Athanasius, not me. Um, he argued that because death was the inevitable result of our sin, the word coming into the world could, uh, you know, he doesn't use terms like representative or federal head or anything like that, but basically he could taste death for everyone. He could experience death for everyone, and therefore death breaks its hold on us. Now, now here's, here's something to think a little bit about. When I think about uh, the church fathers, particularly coming from the East, uh, you know, I think about something kind of organic, uh, something that's sort of like things are kind of bound up with each other at a, at a kind of, uh, in a vital way, if you know what I mean, yeah, as yeah. opposed to a set of decrees and legal categories and, and so yeah, forth. Yeah. You know, I, I think that it's, you know, it's, it, it's something that gets at the same thing. You know, when we talk about you know, right. the federal uh, nature of Adam or the federal nature of Christ um, and how their actions have a kind of uh, effect upon those who are bound to them. Uh, I, I, I still think, though, that uh, what it's, it's being described kind of a, maybe from a, a ground-up way uh, when, you, when you think about someone like Athanasius. Maybe that's not the best way to put it, or maybe that's not the way a genuine, you know, a patristic scholar would have put it. <laughs> it's just yeah. kind of the feel I've got. Yeah, I think I think that's correct. I, I, language like federal headship and stuff like that is really foreign to Athanasius. Right. But there is a sense in which he says that man owed a debt to death, mm-hmm. and Christ yeah. paid that debt, which is remarkably similar to terminology that's going to come up much later. It's yeah. not exactly forensic justification, yeah. but it's getting it, it it's dancing along the edges. Mm-hmm. Well, let me let me read a couple of quick paragraphs here that that'll get at what I was just saying, and that I think will will hit on what you were going on too. What then was God to do? What else could He possibly do, being God, but renew His image in mankind, so that through it men may once more come to know Him? And how could this be done, save by the coming of the very image Himself, our Savior Jesus Christ? Men could not have done it, for they are only made after the image, nor could angels have done it, because they are not the images of God. The word of God came in his own person, because it was he alone, the image of the Father, who could recreate man after the image. Hmm. In order to effect this recreation, however, he had first to do away with death and corruption. Therefore, he assumed a human body, in order that in it, death might once for all be destroyed, and that men might be renewed according to the image. The image of the Father only was sufficient for this need. And he moves on from there. Right, right. So the, the idea is that through Jesus' death, 
and this is something we see over and over again in all kinds of different statements, through Jesus' death, he destroyed death. Well, he destroyed the power of death. And this gets us to, I think, and I don't mean to cut, to cut you off, so sure. please hold on to your thought, but uh, the, the idea of the image. So in, in the East, when we think about the image of God, well, something that's dying cannot be the image of God insofar as God does not die. Right. You see what I'm saying? Well, yeah, we're the at, corruption at, that comes in. Yeah, and that's, right. and that's, I think you both uh, mentioned a little while ago, what, that organic language. It's, it's yeah, connecting to, to, to like existence or being. That right. was very, it's very much in, in the mindset of that world and, and should always be a part of the church's thinking, I think, because that's the very thing. And he'll, he'll even say when, when <laughs> the fall happens, the non-existence, if, you know, because evil doesn't, is, is non-existent. As evil penetrates non-existence, starts to um, something that is not, or maybe another way, mm -hmm. to penetrate. And so what you're getting here is that life itself... Um, um, yeah, like when we, when, when we tend to think when, uh, about the image of God, we think about uh, in, in the sense of, the, of a kind of a regent. You know, we're, yeah. we're uh, in an office, and uh, insofar as we exercise that office, we are behaving as God's image. And that's true. Yeah. But I think that what Athanasius is getting at is, is what you just described. It yeah. has to relate. It's more of a, an argument from, uh, from being, from antas, uh, and because God is the ground of being, that God is the only self-sufficient being, those of us who are you know, uh, dependent upon that being, when we are cut off from that being, we no longer bear the, that particular peculiar thing that is only true of God, which is he doesn't die. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll notice when he was talking about the image there, he connects it to the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he says that is ignored by the creeds, incidentally, is that in Jesus's life, he renewed the knowledge of God. He taught the knowledge of God in his words and his deeds, in his actions, mm -hmm. so that Jesus' life becomes a way in which human, his life, not just his death and resurrection, yes. becomes a way in which human beings can once again learn to know God. They're, they're, that was a huge point. Tom Torrance, yeah, you know him, a big, uh, kind of very influenced by Bart, um, yeah, Scottish sure. Reformed uh, figure. Yeah, he has a complicated re relationship to, to the rest of the Reform. But one of his, his big insights, is he was a big, he shaped a lot of his understanding from, from um, um, Athanasius. Athanasius. And one of the things he actually said, because somebody asked him once, you know, when were you converted? And he, he gave the, you know, Christmas birthday, the incarnation. Oh, yeah. I was, I was born, when were you born again? Well, I was born again when Jesus was born. Yeah, and his point yeah. was that Athanasian point, is that it's the life um, from the incarnation on that is a part of that whole thing. Um, it's not, not my subjective realization of yeah, it. Yeah, it, it yeah. It's that life lived, right. and then the significance of that life. Um, so it's not just the, 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 the sacrificial that we tend to put on. That, that's, the, that's the high point of mm -hmm, it. That's mm -hmm. the, the redemptive moment, but it's that whole life too, and that, that's what connects it to, and this is very interesting because it does show something that I think it often gets, you know, we often say, what would Jesus do? You know, that kind right, of thing. Right. But we very, very carelessly look at what he actually, how he lived, right. that form of existence, which is the image of God. Right. Yeah, N.T. Wright talks about this as well, where he says, you know, we really ignore Jesus' life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we focus on the incarnation, we focus on his death and resurrection. We don't pay attention to his teaching. Yeah. We don't pay attention. You know, I mean, we'll talk about the miracles sort of in an apologetic way, but we don't really focus on what he taught, what he did, <laughs> all of those kinds of things. And he says, frankly, the creeds did us an injustice here. He says, now, the creeds were written to address specific issues in their own day. Nobody in that day thought that, it was, uh, that we shouldn't be focused on obeying Christ and following him yeah. and paying attention to his teachings and all those sort of things. That was not an issue. Yeah, that would tend and, to be taken for granted. And, and then, so yeah. that was left out of the creeds. Yeah. But that's exactly the message that's missing today. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. It's always the stuff that's taken for granted that uh, you end up losing. Right. You know, it's, and then those become your blind spots. And then, yeah, that's, that's exactly what Lewis was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to move on. Here's another point connected to this, mm -hmm. but that he takes a little bit further. And All set. I'll be, 
I'll be honest with you, I don't know entirely what I think of this point. Okay. But he says, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping for the, if, you, if any of you have uh, this, this is between uh, paragraphs 16 and 17 or whatever the unit is here. And this is chapter two? Um, we you know, the, the paragraphs are all numbered sequentially, at least in mind. Oh, okay. So. So. He says, um, actually, we were well past chapter two. Okay. Uh, he says, uh, there were thus two things which the Savior did for us by becoming man. He banished death from us and he made us anew. And, invisible and imperceptible as he himself is, he became visible through his works and revealed himself as the word of the Father, the ruler, and the king of the whole creation. Through his works. Through his works. Now, by the way, it's worth noting that that um, he talks in terms of something that theologians have referred to as divine accommodation here. Right. That is to say that Calvin talks about God lisping to us. Right. Uh, or speaking baby talk to us. He, he communicated to us in terms that we can understand mm-hmm. um, about the nature of God and so on. Now, th- this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I wrote two master's theses on accommodation. Hmm. So, right. the, yeah. um, so I figure I have to at least throw that in. <laughs> but, but then, you know, so, so he, he abolishes death and he reveals the knowledge of God to us by his work, works and word. But then... then Athanasius goes on to say, there's a paradox in this last statement which we must now examine. The word was not hedged in by his body, nor did his presence in the body prevent his being present elsewhere as well. When he moved his body, he did not cease also to direct the universe Mm -hmm. by his mind and might. Yeah, yeah, that's... that's, That's something I've never... I mean, on, on one level... He, when he says it, it's like, well, yeah, that ought to be obvious, but somehow I never really thought of it. Yeah. Well, I think a part of the reason it may not be obvious is because there's been a kind of division of, of tasks in the Godhead that uh, people have kind of thoughtlessly and, and unscripturally yeah, yeah, yeah. assigned. So the Father is supposed to be running the world. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Except that's not what it says in exactly. Colossians. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and so Jesus didn't give up. Excuse me. The second person of the Trinity did not give up his role in running the universe through the kenosis when he became incarnate as Jesus. Right. Yeah, right. And being the unifying uh, point of it. Right. I mean, that's that's the other the other part of it is he, he all things in him are held together. Mm-hmm. So you're here in, in his contingency. Yeah. So he, did, he, so when he, while he was incarnate, did everything just fall apart? Was there like <laughs> you know uh, you know. Throughout the universe, you know, su- you know, planets yeah. falling into yeah. their suns, you know, <laughs> and even even in his death, I mean, it's all right. being held together, right? And being, in, in, if anything, uh, being more firmly held together, right, right. Uh, but yeah, that that's uh, a lot of people, you know, because they yeah they tend to to break up the the, the unified trinitarian work. They think some other person of the Godhead is carrying out those things while the Son is doing this, and they—I they, mean, it is beyond. Let's admit it's a mystery uh, it, to be adored than something to fully unpack. But I think Athanasius is digging in places that, you know, these are glimpses we're given in Scripture, and and so we should kind of consider them. Well, I think we've talked a lot about uh, the inability of, of uh, many Christians to think about creation. Uh, at, in many respects, apart from the thing that you noted earlier, Glenn, yeah. our, our, our concern about time and dates and, and duration and stuff like that, as though if we had that all resolved, everything mm-hmm. would just sort of, everything we needed to know about creation would just be, you know, we didn't, wouldn't need to think about anything else. Right. Whereas, whereas um, if we think about Christ, the creator, okay, just think about that statement. You know, how often have you heard your pastor refer to Christ as the creator, yeah. as the one through whom all things came into being? And therefore, as the Logos, the, the interpretive center, not only of Scripture, but of all of all creation. Of rea- all of reality. All right? of reality. Yeah. He's the one who illumines that moral and created order that has been there all along, has fallen, been redeemed, restored, and is moving to, and he embodies the perfection of it, the right. first fruits of right. the new creation. Yeah. Augustine argues that all human knowledge, believer or unbeliever, secular or religious or whatever, all knowledge is mediated through Christ. Christ. Yeah, right. and this is where, I mean, I mean we, we give Bart oftentimes a hard time, but this, I think, was one of his real, real solidly Christian points, is Chris, Christology 
is at the heart of everything Christian. I mean, he, he may be overemphasized that you need to need, read uh, creation thoroughly through the lens of redemption, but it, it's because with natural theology, it was working in the work, in the opposite direction as enlightenment natural theology. Right. So his worry was that the eclipse of this very point. Um, but after he he so emphasized that with only <laughs> with the with right. the with the huge, yeah, he ended up falling back on the other side. Other of the side. Pit. Yeah. And I don't think he intended to, but I just think he. I just think the imagination, if the imaginative ability were there, and I don't think any human has it. Um, I think he would have been he would have been on to it, and and there are, you know, well, as, uh, Bart like mm-hmm. everybody else was a creature of his era. That's right. And his right. upbringing and everything else, and yeah. there were certain things that yeah. were blind spots for him, places where he did not think he could go. That's right. And you know that that's true of all of us. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, um, I'm going to move on to the death of Christ. Okay. 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 And <laughs> the thing that is curious about this to me. Is I mean I'm I'm going to skip over a lot of the discussion where the the things that we're more familiar with about you know d- destroying death and things like that. I found it interesting that he actually spends a great deal of time talking about why crucifixion, as opposed to another form of death. as opposed to another form of death. Okay. He does this particularly when he's when he's refuting the pagans. Okay. <laughs> okay. But he actually has an interesting paragraph here that, that's worth noting. <laughs> this is in chapter 4, for those of you who are interested. <laughs> so much for the objections outside the church. Okay. Um, but if any honest Christian wants to know why he suffered death on the cross and not in some other way, we answer thus. In no other way was it expedient for us. Indeed, the Lord offered for our sakes the one death that was supremely good. He had come to bear the curse that lay on us. And how could he, quote, become a curse otherwise than by accepting the accursed death? Hmm. And that death is the cross, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Again, the death of the Lord is the ransom of all, and by it, the middle wall of partition is broken down and the call of the Gentiles comes about. How could he have called us if he had not been crucified? For it is only on the cross that a man dies with arms outstretched. Hmm. Yeah. Here yeah, again we see yeah. the fitness of his death and of those outstretched arms. It was that he might draw his ancient people with one and the Gentiles with the other hmm. and join both together in himself. Even so, he foretold the manner of his redeeming death. I, if I am lifted up, will draw all men to myself. Hmm. Again, the heir is the sphere of the devil the enemy of our race, who, having fallen from heaven, endeavors with the other evil spirits who shared in his disobedience, both to keep souls from the truth and to hinder the progress of those who are trying to follow it. The apostle refers to this when he says, quote, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now at work in the work, excuse me, that now works in the sons of disobedience. But the Lord came to overthrow the devil and to purify the air and to make a way for us up to heaven, as the apostle says, through the veil, that is to say, through his flesh. This had to be done through death, and by what other kind of death could it be done, save by a death in the air, that is, on the cross? Here again, you see how right and natural it is that the Lord should suffer thus, for thus being, for being thus lifted up. He cleansed the air from all the evil influences of the enemy. Hmm. I beheld Satan fall like lightning. Right. And he goes on. All right. hey, this is not a way that we think. <laughs> no, no, no. It, what, it, what it requires is a, a is a is a uh, being attuned to uh, a kind of choreography of meaning, you know, or, or an embodiment of meaning, uh, and a suffusion of meaning throughout all of reality. Yeah. So that everything means something. So yeah. today, and, most and, and again, we're at this issue of fa- of meaning rather than just facts. Right. That's yeah. Right. We we want to limit ourselves to the facts. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. in the minds of many people, I think they would say, well, it wouldn't have mattered the way he died just so long as it was, uh, you know, something that had been uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a manner of execution. So, yeah. you know, drinking the hemlock the, or having, an, you know, the, being the, an electric the no, chair. The nominalists again. <laughs> right, right. Whereas what Athanasius is saying, no, is that all of this is, is orchestrated. And, 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 and I don't know how you argue with this point about the air, I mean, being the realm. I just don't think that even people know how to interpret that 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 statement by the Apostle Paul. Where, right. You know, yeah. they, he says the prince of the power of the air. People are like, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't. They don't even think there. You know. Yeah, they're thinking. You know, a huge electrical tower or something <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> controlling. 
you know, <laughs> electricity or something within a place. They, yeah, there's no, they're, they're a lot of the imagery, but what you see is someone completely immersed in the scriptures and the theology of the church and, and the worship of the church here. And, 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 and again, something we've talked about before, the sacramental nature of reality. Yeah. All of reality points beyond itself yeah. to greater and deeper spiritual things. Yeah. So, so he, he, what we have is we have Christ on the cross, you know, and that fulfills the, the, the you know, the, uh, the, uh, the notion that, you know, curses everyone who hangs on hangs a, tree, a tree, but his arms are spread, which is a sign of invitation to invitation, bring people that's in. Right. And then one hand to the Gentiles, another hand to the, to, you know, Israel saying, you know, let's, Let's bring it all together here. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. a it's a marvelous. Um, then he does piece actually have a section on, isn't it, on relation to the Jews, right? Yeah, Refu- but, in the refutation he, he has, of the Jews. refutations of the Jews and his refutation of the Gentiles. It's worth noting that the early church didn't think of itself as either Jew or Gentile. It thought right. of itself as as a third third category. A third category. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. But 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 what you have going on with all of that is this sense that um, uh, everything. Uh, means something, and everything that means something relates to the one who who, who mm-hmm. is the source of all meaning, yeah. which is Christ. Right. Yeah. And so this is there. There are no accidents. There are That's no right. meaning meaningless acts. Everything. Um, no. You, 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 sometimes you come across people who have a background in communications theory, and they'll note how much, and when it comes to human communication, uh, you know that communication is nonverbal. You know, we talk about tone, inflection, facial expression, body language, all these different things. And um, when you lose all of those things, it becomes a lot more difficult to understand what a person really is saying. You know, if you say something ironic in nature, it might be taken as literal. Yeah. If you can't see the person's facial expression or, yeah. you know, his posture or, you know, that kind of stuff. So what this does is it takes it even further. The one who made everything, yeah. Yeah. right, mm-hmm. uh, made everything to help us know him in some sense. Yeah. So everything is serviceable. Everything yeah. from a human gesture to how the atmosphere, you know, is That's surrounding right. us. The, the, what is it? The, the visible creation in every aspect of it as created good. Um, and even in the fall, uh, 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 that the, 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 the created nature of it doesn't cease. Um, and so in all of that, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. Right, right. To, and, uh, to move us to what should be innate mm-hmm. um, is thankfulness and gratitude. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, there's your sacramental nature. That, and then if you look at Genesis, I mean, and, and God said word, in, mm-hmm. infusing into creation, right? And God said, let the, this bring forth this, mm-hmm. um, let this be. And so what you have is, is the Logos is, is formed in accordance with word, the mm-hmm. word right. who, that, that uh, illumines everything, but also mm-hmm. I think it informs everything. And so that every single part and particle and, and aspect of creation is, has something of the refraction of the eternal Logos in it and mm-hmm. finds its fullest meaning and reference in relationship to it. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way of putting it, refraction, because not, no, no aspect is entirely, uh, you know, capacious enough to hold the whole. That's right, that's right. But there's something there. There. And it's meant this, you know, they, uh, oftentimes, you know, they, you know they, I think the, the, the patristic traditions, the theophanic nature of creation, mm-hmm. that it's meant to, um, um, you know, to, to manifest the, the glory of God. The, the glory of God communicates itself to it in such right. a way that it, it finds its perfection in glorifying God. So how could God, with that in mind, just let it go? Just yeah. say, well, it's given over to death. Well, you know, easy when, come, easy go. Win some, you lose some. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, And I'm going to keep moving on. All right. right. This is the point, actually, again, that it was just really surprising to me for a whole lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. He moves on in chapter 5 to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the resurrection is he doesn't do what I do with the resurrection, which is give a, 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 a defense of it. Mm-hmm. You know, why this is a historical fact. Right, 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 Instead, right. what he does is he looks at its impact on us. 
Mm. Now, he begins with his discussion of the fall from the perspective of God. Mm. But here with the resurrection, he talks about it in terms of its impact on us and right, where this right. what where mm. this goes with us. Right. Mm. So one of the things that he says, this is uh, chapter five on the resurrection, uh, section twenty seven. Mm. A very strong proof of this destruction of death and its conquest uh, and its conquest by the cross is supplied by a present fact, namely this: all the disciples of Christ despise death. Mm -hmm. They take the offensive against it and instead of fearing it, by the sign of the cross and by faith in Christ, trample on it as something dead. Hmm. 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 And now remember, Athanasius has lived through the great persecution. The most severe persecution of the church occurred under Diocletian. Athanasius lived through this. This was the great age of the Roman martyrs. Yeah, right. And what he saw and what was self-evident to everyone is that Christians despised death. They didn't care. Mm -hmm. And if death was going to come, they'll go trample on it as if it were something dead itself. Right, right. Um, I look at this and... I cannot help but ask myself the question whether you could make this argument in the contemporary church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I think that, well, uh, I think that the the, the present moment when we have a disease that has a uh, mortality rate of what? 0.00 Point zero zero whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know. In other words, ninety nine point whatever survive just fine. Well, and, and, yet and we're all in. You know, there are some people who have never come out of their homes since March. Yeah, and in contrast, I mean, uh, Saint Anthony, who who was, uh, you know, uh, one of, went to the desert. One of the desert monks, um, part of the founding of the monastic order um, that the Athanasian kind of stirred, especially even in the West, but. One of the things that was central, thank you, um, to him is that he was looking forward to being a martyr. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this wasn't kind of, you know, death lust. This was life love. Yeah, yeah. It was a totally yeah. different thing. It was That's that, a good way to put it. Yeah. Because I think that we tend to look at that longing to mar- for martyrdom as, the, as what you, you know, uh, as a, a death wish. That's right. And so for, for the Christian, they're... They had such an utmost confidence in the resurrection of Christ that they, they, it was an unshakable, where I think we have a weak need confidence in it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's this great quote in the same thing, section 27, where he says, But the devil, who of old wickedly exulted in death, now that the pains of death are loosed, he alone is he who remains truly dead. <laughs> Um, and, and in a sense, that, that's, that's a huge contrast he's building, is that, that uh, death is to be feared if you're aligned with the one who now is mm-hmm. death itself, yeah. Satan. Yeah. Whereas when Christ, who is life itself, is the, uh, death is a stepping stone for that, there's nothing to be feared. And when that is the case, again, that's where the world's turned upside down because there isn't um, neither death height nor depth nor things present or things to come can separate one from this um, there, there is a confidence in, in the God of the gospel that I think is, is what made the church so powerful in its weakness and if you, take a look, if you take a look at the early epidemics that went through the Roman Empire the Christians were the only ones who hung around to tend people uh, there's at least one of them I found a quote from one person who said that if he died during plague, it was martyrdom. It didn't matter one way or another. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, you know, the, and there's plenty of testimony that said that during plagues, Christians acted with complete disregard for their own lives to tend to sick. Yeah. Because they knew that if they died, they moved to a better life. And further, I think part of it is that Jesus was a healer. And so they did what they could to live in imitation of him. And so for today's, <laughs> for today, I'm being crass now, but for today's, uh, True disciples. I mean, you can either die from COVID or a Biden administration, but, <laughs> or, but you know, or you could actually have life in Christ. <laughs> well, or and a series of other things. It seems yeah. as though uh, you know the the uh, the cure is is bad, if not worse, than the disease. That's right. You know, the psychological uh, well being. Um, you know, you know, economic well being. A lot of other things have been sacrificed at the altar of uh, not getting the disease or giving the disease. And I think uh, 
one of the things I'd like to re- explore a little bit with the, with you guys uh, as uh, we think about death is kind of its corollaries, mm-hmm. sort of uh, like, for example, uh, social shame. So uh, shame, when you are rejected, uh, when you are uh, considered unworthy of regard, is a kind of social death. That's a, as fear, is sort of fearsome as physical death for many people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're not unrelated things. I mean, Jesus died, uh, you know, the object of shame. You know, this is something that was directed toward him by the authorities, by the onlookers, and so forth. It was, this was a shameful way to die. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the, the death and resurrection of, of, of our Lord, uh, it, it deals with not only the physical, you know, cessation of life, but other kinds of ancillary and related things, mm-hmm. uh, including shame. Because I think that we have this idea I think when we read something like Fox's Book of Martyrs or something like that, that as people looked on and saw <laughs> these great Christians dying in the flames, that everybody was feeling kind of ashamed of themselves. <laughs> they were like, oh, I can't believe that I, uh, you know, I condoned this. Uh, no, they were cheering lustily mm-hmm. and yeah. mocking these people as they yeah. were consumed by the flames or... Yeah. died as they were being stoned. These people who were doing these things to them felt like they were doing the right thing. Yeah. So yeah. that's something... And I think further, we, they felt superior. Yeah. 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 We, need to, we need to have that sink in because uh, if, we, if we have this uh, illusion that uh, even as we die, everybody is sort of uh, aware that they're in the wrong and we're in the right, well we're going to be gravely disappointed if we ever find ourselves in that spot because we're not going to enjoy even that measure of satisfaction of mm-hmm. knowing that we're right or they, and they know we're right. <laughs> no, they, yeah. might, they might actually say, you deserved it. In fact, I wish it would have been more painful. <laughs> yeah. And you know, what, what I'm, I'm kind of struck by through, through this is, again, our discussion about the nature of evil. Um, evil in really coming through Neoplatonism, but I think this is very consistent with the Christian view, is that evil is not a thing. It does not have ontological existence. That's right. Evil is a negation of of the good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Okay? mm -hmm. So it's a parasite. It does not live on its own. Mm -hmm. It's a negation of the good. So when you're talking about shame, what are you talking about? You're talking about a person's negation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ultimate example of this is cancel culture yep. what's yeah. happening you are being negated yep yeah yeah you know all of these kinds of things all and death what is it it is the negation of life mm-hmm. yeah you know all of these things do come together right right yeah yeah a lot of people say i can't imagine living if this happened or that happened if i mm. lost my job or if i lost mm. my social stat standing or or i've lost my home or what have you and because of that death really does have a hold of them. That's right. And it's, it contrasts, you know, uh, Scripture, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Right. Um, and, and it is, you know, it, it is this kind of, you know, um, secular sense that the here and now is everything mm-hmm. and that there isn't any. And, I, and this is something, you know, we, we go back a lot of episodes. It was something I was thinking about writing a book on once. I may return to it. Is the eclipse of the eternal vision. I know others are writing on it, uh, Hans Burzma and others from their own tradition. But I really think that's a heart of it. I mean, this is something Augustine's onto with the city of God and stuff. It's, you know, city of man, city of God. Is that, um, is that the here and now, the this worldly, my best life now, right. is so of such, um, such importance that if I don't get to realize it in every fullest sense somehow I'm being cheated Mm -hmm. and therefore all is lost right and And, even for Christians they really I'd I'd like to point out that if this is your best life now you're going to be in real trouble after you die (laughs) that's right that's right that's right Um, yeah yeah the the um I'd, I'd, I'd like to push this a little bit further. I'm, I'm just going to go thematically rather than through sure. the, the rest of this. Right. But one of the other interesting things he says is, you know, there are several dimensions to this. 
It's the way the world was transformed with the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He says that, for example, um, in Daniel's prophecy about the 70 weeks, it talks mm-hmm. about prophecy ceasing and things like that. It says there are no more, there are no more prophets within, within Judaism. The temple's destroyed. It, it's just, it's over. Mm-hmm. So as you look at the pagan world, Pagan religions are increasingly questioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Demonic activity. The demons flee at the name of Christ and the sign of the cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he says that um, the barbarians who gloried in, in death and destruction are suddenly living in peace and love with each other. It's transforming communities. Mm-hmm. He says that, you know, if you're, you know, the pagan religions, if you cross the borders of a kingdom, you stop worshiping one God and you start worshiping another. Now there is one God that's in, that is being worshiped in India and Rome and Persia and all over the world. Yeah. This one God is now being worshiped. It's uniting things right. that in a way that has never been seen before. So he talks a lot about the complete transformation of religious, moral, and social and ethical life yeah. that occurs with the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Yep. And basically he says, you know, dead people can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Jesus is doing this. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And what, what struck me particularly about that is with my, my exposure to Sierra Leone in many places in the third world, um, this is a living fact in, for example, in, in um, uh, New Harvest Global Ministries in Sierra Leone. Uh, I, I, I know the, a number of the leaders there. I know the guy who started it and who, who is, I think, one of the great unsung saints of the 21st century. He, ha- he was, they were planning where they were going to send out missionaries. It's an indigenous mm-hmm. Christian organization that evangelizes within their own country and beyond, actually, all across Africa. But they were planning where they were going to, they're having a prayer meeting, planning where they were going to send out missionaries. And a guy drove up, a local, frankly, warlord, with a bunch of, of his guys in his truck, drove up to the compound and pulled in and stopped. And they looked at it and said, all right, this could, this could be trouble. Um, but they, they stayed back. They kept their distance while they prayed. And once the prayer meeting was broken up, they went up and approached him and said, who's in charge here? And Shadanke, the leader, said, well, if anybody's going to be shot, it's going to be me. So he said, I, I am. He said, all right, I need to talk to you. He says, okay, what, what, what do you need to talk about? He said, I need you to send your storytellers, which is what they call the missionaries. I need you to send your storytellers to our village. And Shadanke said, well, can I ask you why? And what he said is, I have seen what happens when your storytellers come to villages. I have seen villages that have been at war with each other for generations, planting crops together peacefully. I've seen families that have been fighting each other, united and living together peacefully. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're telling them, but whatever it is, we need to hear it. Yeah, that's great. And then, well, there's more to the story, but let me just add this coda to it. Shidanke stopped counting after the 35th time this happened. That is the power of the resurrected Christ, and that's what Athanasius right. was talking right. about. And, and you notice with them is they, you know, they're they're from from the world in which causal and principal arguments were central, in rather than historic apologetic, right? The cause, you know, to to explain the effect, one can draw it back to certain kinds of principles, and only certain kind of principles make sense of the fact. And so the resurrection, being the best principle from which and cause from which these things happen um, rather than, than, you know, I mean, that's the way they're looking at it. And that's, if you notice that in his language, he'll even say that very quickly, the cause of this must be this. Yes. Right, um, right. And, and they're not afraid from that language where we tend to, we want to move away from principles, the sources from which things happen and causes, you know, the, 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 the cause, you know, for, um, which brought about something to kind of quantitative. And when we do that, it enters that whole domain of interpretive. 
which causal and principle, that's a whole other thing. It's probably confusing people at this point. But the, the classical way of viewing these things was such that you had to come down somewhere, and Athanasius understood where you had to come down, and the church did, um, both in relationship to its doctrine of God and Christ's resurrection. Yeah, when the gospel is preached, things happen. Yeah. That's, yeah. a, that's a good point to, to sort of draw this in, because we're, we're, we're at the time that we should wrap things up. We had a request this past week to do a little better job of maybe summarizing our thoughts. I don't know if you have anything that you want to say, Tom, with re- relationship to that. Um, <laughs> no, my best thing to say is go out and uh, get a copy or online and read it um, and yeah, think I, about it. And then it's not if a you terribly need, large book. And if you need to send us a note about it, that would be fun. Um, can't say we'll respond to everything, but <laughs> we would be happy to. But uh, I think there are many works like this in the, in the whole work of our early brothers and sisters that uh, uh, wrote and thought and gave us you know, brought the faith to us. So that edition, how many pages is that? This, Just one, so folks know. Uh, this one is sums up, it's 119 pages. Uh, this one's the uh, one, it's got the introduction to by C.S. Lewis. It's on St. Vladimir Seminary Press. It's on the incarnation by St. Athanasius. If you look it up online and ask for Athanasius on the incarnation PDF, mm-hmm. at least what comes up on Google, the second one down is a PDF that is 39 pages long, including the, type, the title page, oh, wow. with the introduction by C.S. Lewis. Yep. That's and a that's, smaller print and, than and, your book. And, yeah, and, and, <laughs> yeah, and that, that's the one I used. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree with Tom. The best thing that you can do is to pick this thing up and read it. I gave you some of the highlights of it. There's actually one final thing I would like to read. Sure, please. <laughs> and um, this is, I, I think that our lives, our faith is immeasurably enriched by encountering the great thinkers of the faith Mm -hmm. because they bring perspectives to us that we do not have in our modern world. And while we can say, yeah, we might not agree with everything in there, there's nothing in here that isn't worth considering and really pondering. But one of the things he says... as he's heading toward his conclusion in his refutation of the Gentiles, Hmm. is one of the, probably the most famous statement from this book, although it's usually translated a little bit differently than what I have here. He talks about the impact of this. What, What is it that Christ has accomplished? He says, he indeed assumed humanity that we might become God. Yep. He, now, he doesn't mean literally become yeah, God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're not talking like the Mormons. Yeah, yeah we're, 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 talking, we're talking what the Orthodox world calls theosis, yeah. right? becoming partakers of the divine Divine nature, life. Being yeah. united with Christ in Paul's words. Yeah. That's cr- what he's referring to. Basically, we could say it, it would be a creaturely share in Christ's sonship mm-hmm. in relationship to the Trinity for those in the Reform world. Mm-hmm. A creaturely share in Christ's Sonship. Right. Right. Yeah. So, again, let, let me read yeah. that, and then I'll continue on again. Um, he indeed assumed humanity that we might become God. He manifested himself by means of a body in order that we might perceive the mind of the unseen Father. Mm-hmm. He endured shame from men that we might, by his own impassibility— uh, excuse me, that we might inherit immortality. I'm, I crossed lines here. He endured shame from men that we might inherit immortality. He himself was unhurt by this, for he is impassible and incorruptible. But by his own impassibility, he kept and healed the suffering men on whose account he thus this endured. In short, such and so many are the Savior's achievements that follow from his incarnation that to try to number them is like gazing at the open sea and trying to count the waves. Mm. I think that, as I said, this is worth reading, worth pondering, especially during Advent as we're adding up Mm -hmm. to Christmas. Yeah, good stuff. And it's available for free. That's right. It's public domain. Yeah. All right. Well, great stuff. Why don't we wrap it up here at this point? There's a, a lot uh, that we've given our listeners to, to go home and, and do. So I think we can feel good about ourselves as, uh, as, as people who have loaded on the backs of our listeners great 
bird. No, <laughs> <laughs> but we will lift a finger to help. Them. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening to the Theology Podcast. We really do appreciate all the support, and we we are, as we've said many times, astounded at the number of people who care about what we have to talk about. Anyway, bye bye. Bye now. Bye now.